Hi, it's Dwyer. Dwyercrime.blog. Also, always 1776.com. Let's talk about a case that has landed an individual on death row. His name is Ivan Cantu. This comes out of the state of Texas. Cantu was actually scheduled to be executed. Recently, a Texas judge, and I tip my hat to the judge, a Texas judge stepped in and the execution has been taken off calendar while further investigation is done about the facts of the case. But just understand this is a death penalty conviction case. We're now talking post-conviction. What I want viewers to do is to listen closely and to just consider the possibility that our judicial system at times makes mistakes, even when the stakes are as high as they are in a death penalty case. I believe we as a society mean well. Uh, this is not the Jim Crow 1940s and 1950s. I actually do believe that we want to convict only the truly guilty. Right? The problem is that's not the way the system works. Let me also point out, too, that the major question that underlies our criminal justice system, that juries need to answer, isn't whether or not they think the defendant did the crime. No, the question is whether the prosecution has proved the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me also point out that there are more players in this social play, right? The prosecution will have star witnesses. In appellate briefs, these witnesses will sound as if they're the most credible person you could come across in life, right? When you look beneath the surface, you'll find out that these witnesses sometimes are deeply flawed. We know that objectively because what they're telling us is inconsistent with the actual evidence. So let's talk about this Ivan Cantu case. Let's talk about one of the prosecution's star witnesses, his girlfriend, Amy B., we'll call her. Right? Just understand, too, that one of the murder victims was a woman who, ironically, was named Amy. We'll call her murder victim Amy just to separate out the players here. Now, Ivan Cantu, he's in his late 20s at the time. He's living in an apartment with Amy B., who, according to reports, has a drug problem. They live not too far from Ivan Cantu's cousin, James Mosqueda, who apparently, according to reports, was a drug dealer. Right? Ivan Cantu, you should know, according to reports, also had a drug problem. Folks, understand the Ivan Cantu story is a drug story. We should realize that early on. James Mosqueda's fiance was murder victim Amy. Now just understand, according to Amy B's testimony, she's the girlfriend of Ivan Cantu. Cantu calls Mosqueda on the night of November 3rd, 2000 at approximately 11.30 p.m. In other words, folks, this is at night. Cantu calls his cousin, who's a drug dealer. Right? He asks his cousin if he can come over. Cantu then tells his girlfriend, Amy B., that he is going to his cousin's house to kill his cousin, Robert, excuse me, James Mosqueda, and James's fiance, murder victim Amy.
Cantu then leaves his apartment, the one he shares with Amy B, with a gun, and he returns one hour later with James Mosqueda's fiance, murder victim Amy's Mercedes. According to Amy B, Cantu's face is swollen. Cantu is wearing jeans that appear to have blood on them. Cantu also appears to have blood in his hair. Cantu also has Mosqueda's and murder victim Amy's identification and keys. So as Cantu cleans up at home, his girlfriend Amy B throws his bloody jeans into the trash can on the night of the murder. Cantu then takes his girlfriend, Amy B, to the victim's home in the Mercedes that he previously stole earlier from that home. There, Amy B, and this is compelling testimony if you're a juror, Amy B claims she saw both victims' bodies through the doorway to the master bedroom while Cantu was searching the house for drugs and money. Cantu then decides to take the engagement ring of murder victim Amy and he gives it to his girlfriend, Amy B. Right? Cantu then leaves the Mercedes that he and Amy B drove over to the crime site, at the crime site, and he instead takes Mosqueda's Corvette. Right, Mosqueda was a drug dealer who had more than one car. The couple then drives to Arkansas to visit Amy B's parents. Now just understand, this evidence, as you can imagine, was devastating. The defendant's girlfriend is the one who gives it. And she is talking about having seen the murder victim's bodies. She's talking about her boyfriend taking her to the murder scene. And of course, she even talks about how she helps throw his bloody jeans into a trash can. Understand the story is vivid because it even has a time element to it. Right? Cantu, of course, leaves at 1130, comes back an hour later, then goes over there with his girlfriend later that night. Now, what I want people to understand is that this compelling evidence that helps sway a jury has holes in it. Folks, the holes are substantial. Understand, it's the attorney's job, Cantu's attorney's job, to point out the holes in the story, to point to the credibility of competing witnesses with alternative stories. So what I want folks to understand is after Ivan Cantu's mom heard that her nephew, right, because Mosqueda is Cantu's cousin, was murdered. She called the police and they did a welfare check on the Cantu residence. This is the day after the bodies are found. Now just understand that there is a police officer, a member of law enforcement, who 
visits the home with Ivan Cantu's mother. Now, it's interesting because Amy B., the star witness, claimed that she put Cantu's bloody jeans in the trash can. The member of law enforcement who did the wellness check. This is while Cantu and Amy are in Arkansas. At the house, do not see any bloody jeans in the trash can. Let's go one step further. The jeans are supposed to be soaked with blood. Things are supposed to be happening at night. There aren't blood stains all over the apartment. In other words, Cantu shows up, the jeans are bloody, Amy claims that while he cleaned up, she puts the jeans in the trash can. Folks, there's no blood around the apartment. Law enforcement doesn't see bloody jeans. Somehow, days later, bloody jeans mysteriously appear in the trash can. Now, either the member of law enforcement was in error during a welfare check, didn't actually look to see what was going on, even though a double homicide led to the welfare check. Even though the people killed were a drug dealer and his girlfriend, who had multiple cars, a Mercedes and a Corvette at a minimum. Right? Understand you have a member of law enforcement in a death penalty case who's contradicting the prosecution star witness. Well, days later, believe it or not, bloody jeans show up in the trash can. But there are problems. But jeans aren't Cantu's size. Right? The DNA tests. And keep in mind, Cantu is supposed to have done this spur of the moment. He's supposed to have a drug problem. His attention to detail might not be the best, especially when he tells his girlfriend, Amy B., that he's going to visit his cousin to kill his cousin and his fiance. Then he comes home bloody. By the way, they live in an apartment. Nobody sees him come home bloody. Right? There are other people living in the apartment building with him. No one sees him come home bloody. Well, of course, the jeans that have blood on them that are later found in the trash can not only aren't Cantu size, but tests don't find conclusive evidence of Cantu's DNA on the jeans. Well, let me point out to another part of Amy B's story that seems a bit suspect is her claim that Cantu takes a Rolex from the murder victim. And then while she is in the car with her boyfriend Cantu, Cantu throws the Rolex watch out of the car window shortly after the murders. Here's the problem. Believe it or not, the Rolex was found in the murder victim's home. That Rolex was never in the car with Amy B. and Ivan Cantu. That part of Amy B.'s story seems to be wrong. In fact, the Rolex was returned to Mosqueda's family, the murder victim's family. Let me also say, too, that a part of Amy B.'s story that was interesting was the idea that after killing his cousin and his cousin's fiance, Cantu takes the fiance's engagement ring proposes to Amy B. and gives her the engagement ring. Just think about the level of depravity. Let me kill someone, let me take their engagement ring, and let me use that to propose to my girlfriend. Right? Here's the problem, folks. The engagement ring was never found. 
There were also a number of people who claimed that Cantu and girlfriend Amy B were already engaged before the night of the murder. That's inconsistent with Amy's story that on the fly, Cantu takes this engagement ring and gives it to his girlfriend as part of a proposal. Understand, too, one of the problems involved in the case. Amy B's timeline does not match the autopsies on the bodies. Right? The night is supposed to have started at 11.30 p.m. Cantu is supposed to have come back an hour later. Bloody. They clean up. Cantu decides he's going to take Amy B back to the murder scene. Right? So he can search the murder scene for drugs and money. Well, understand two forensic pathologists, two, looked at the rigor mortis on the murder victim's bodies. And again, it's a drug dealer and his girlfriend. And that rigor mortis suggests that the killings did not occur at night, that they actually occurred Saturday morning. Let me point out something major here. And I think this is major. Star witness Ivan Cantu girlfriend Amy B has a brother. His name was Jeff. Believe it or not, Jeff claimed that Ivan Cantu had recruited him to help clean up after the murders. Believe it or not, Jeff later admitted that that story was false. So one wonders, why would a sibling of the star witness be offering false testimony in a murder investigation? Why did the sibling of the star witness feel a need to bolster his sister's testimony? So, just understand, folks, there is evidence that, on the face of it, contradicts Amy B's story in a death penalty case. Well, we also have other evidence that's mentioned in some of the court submissions that you should know about. Now, understand that according to Amy B, her and Cantu leave for Arkansas, right? The murder has taken place. Uh, Cantu takes her back to the murder scene looking for drugs and money. Then they leave. They go to Arkansas. Here's the problem. We now know that during the period of time when Cantu and girlfriend Amy B are not supposed to have been in Cantu's apartment, and this is important, right, because some of the evidence against Cantu involves items like bloody jeans found at his apartment, right? We now know that the day after the murder, in fact, it's the night after the murder, when he and Amy B are supposedly in Arkansas, telephone records indicate that someone made a phone call from their apartment. Folks, if there are people in the apartment, when Cantu and Amy B have already left the apartment, if you believe her timeline, then what credibility does any evidence found in the apartment have? Especially after a member of 
law enforcement went to the apartment on a welfare check and did not see bloody jeans in the trash can. Let me also say too that girlfriend Amy B claims that the last time her and Cantu drove the Corvette that was taken from the murder scene was at 6.30 a.m. on November 4th. Right? That's the star witnesses claim. Right? The prosecution wants you to rely on the star witness. Well, now we know that toll tag records show that the Corvette was actually driven almost five hours later at 11.15 a.m. on November 4th. Folks, at a minimum, star witness Amy B's testimony is inconsistent with the toll tag records. Right? We know parts of Amy B's testimony are contradicted by not just law enforcement, but by toll tag records. And this was the testimony that led to the conviction of Ivan Cantu. This is the testimony that led to him being placed on death row. Let me also point out that there's something wrong with the autopsy. The state's blood spatter expert testified that the murder victims were kicked in the face. Believe it or not, the autopsy doesn't mention evidence of the victims being kicked in the face. You and I understand that autopsies are crucial to figuring out the cause of death. They're crucial for these crime reconstructionists to figure out what actually happened. Right here, even the appellate court concedes that the autopsies were a bit sloppy, were a bit incomplete. Folks, how's that possible in a death penalty case? Doesn't the state bear the burden of proof? So if you're a juror, folks, you have a star witness here who's contradicted by a member of law enforcement and who has a timeline that's contradicted from things like toll tag records, right? You have genes that don't even fit Ivan Cantu, and you have an autopsy that overlooks the fact that the murder victims were supposedly kicked and abused on the night they were killed. Right, and that's very important too because Amy B says that Ivan Cantu took a gun over to the crime scene. Right, why would Ivan Cantu stick around and kick people? So, folks, I have problems with this case. Understand how poorly represented Cantu was. And I'm just offering my opinion based on what I've looked at. During the closing statement, believe it or not, Cantu's lawyer conceded Cantu's culpability for murdering two people. Now you'll find out that Cantu, of course, filed paperwork that said he received ineffective assistance of counsel. The attorneys who were accused of ineffective assistance in their paperwork then made the claim that Cantu had confessed to them that he had committed the murders. Right now we can we can say, hey look, that should have been privileged attorney-client communication. The fact that Cantu 
accused his attorneys of ineffective assistance of counsel and on the record at trial asked to represent himself, right, only has himself to blame. If he did tell the attorneys that he did the killings in raising the ineffective assistance of counsel claim, because then the attorneys were able to defend themselves and were able to say, hey, this guy told us that he did the murders. But understand, in criminal law, you should trust no one, right? The attorneys are trying to save their careers. I'm not accusing anyone of lying. I'm just saying this case has many wrinkles, right? People have their own self-interest. Understand, too, that there's a court medical person who examined Cantu and who came to the conclusion that Cantu was bipolar. Now, his attorneys chose not to pre present this evidence in court, right? They have their reasons. Uh, they claim that they talked with relatives of Cantu. And keep in mind, Cantu's using a lot of drugs, according to some reports. Maybe he's self-medicating. And apparently people who knew Cantu did not feel that Cantu had bipolar disorder, right? Unsaid in this briefing is the complete lack of medical training any of these friends had to diagnose someone with bipolar disorder, right, folks? That's not raised at the trial. If you believe that Cantu is manic depressive, then there's a possibility that Cantu might have blamed himself for the murder of his cousin and might have flippantly told his attorneys that he was responsible for the murder. Let's talk about who the actual killers might be. Folks, the murder victims are a drug dealer and his fiance. right? This is a circle that involves illicit activity. Cantu believes that rival drug dealers wanted to kill his cousin. Cantu even has a story where someone visited him at the apartment a pizza delivery person, supposedly, and wanted to know more about his cousin because they wanted to hurt his cousin. Let me also point out, too, that Cantu, when he comes back from Arkansas with his girlfriend, Amy B., they stop at the place for Cantu's ex-girlfriend. It's at the ex girlfriend's apartment that they find the murder victim. Now understand, the murder victim in one place has a fingerprint from Cantu. In another place, it has a fingerprint from murder victim Mascara. Now here's my question, and it needs to be raised. Was this gun planted at his ex-girlfriend's place? Who would know that Cantu and Amy B. stopped by the ex-girlfriend's place when they returned from Arkansas? Right, well, let's be clear here. Let me also point out, too, that the gun is found in a sofa, would Cantu be silly enough to kill two people, go to Arkansas, and instead of ditching the gun there, bring the gun back with him, and then leave the gun lodged in the sofa with an ex-girlfriend, putting her in a tough position. Let me also say this too. And I'm not accusing anyone here of wrongdoing. I understand in these drug scenes, things are hazy for a lot of people. Recollections are distorted. But understand, other than Cantu, 
And other than Cantu's former girlfriend, there's a third person who knew that Cantu visited his ex-girlfriend when he returned from Arkansas. Now, I'm not accusing her of anything, but that third person is Amy B. Let's just point out the obvious here. If, as has been reported, in addition to Cantu having a drug problem, if Amy B had a drug problem, wouldn't she have an incentive to work with drug dealers to make sure that she gets the drug she needs? If she's working with drug dealers who want to knock off Cantu's cousin, is it possible? And these are the possibilities that attorneys need to raise at trial. The goal for, of a defense attorney is to create reasonable doubt. Is it possible that Amy B., whose brother tried to buttress her story, is it possible that Amy B. helped frame Cantu? Right? Because it's Amy B.'s story that places Cantu's supposed bloody jeans in the trash can after law enforcement was already at Cantu's apartment and saw no bloody jeans in the trash can. Right? The jeans, of course, don't even fit Cantu. The DNA isn't definitive. Right, folks? Amy B. is with Cantu at Cantu's ex-girlfriend's apartment. Given that the murder weapon was found in that apartment, are we sure that Cantu left the murder weapon there? Isn't it possible that Amy B. grabbed a gun that Cantu had touched and that whoever did the crime made sure that one of the victim's fingerprints was also put on that gun? So let's just say, if this is typical of the kind of case that leads to a death penalty conviction, right, a case where the star witness's timeline doesn't match up with you know, extraneous evidence, right? The toll tag doesn't match her timeline. A case where the story has obvious holes, right? We took the Rolex, threw it out the window of the car. Then you find out the Rolex was later found at the murder scene and returned to the family, right? He proposed to me, gave me the engagement ring of one of the murder victims, of course, that engagement ring is nowhere to be found now. And, of course, friends claim that they were already engaged. Right, folks, if this is the kind of shoddy evidence that leads to a death penalty conviction, then we here in the United States have a criminal justice system that is in need of an overhaul. Those are my thoughts let me hear yours. You know, really, given the inconsistencies in Amy B.'s testimony, I'm wondering why the prosecution even brought the case against Ivan Cantu. Right, folks, there's not enough here. I know that's upsetting to many people, right? But just understand, the narrative that Cantu, at 11.30 at night, decides he's going to murder two people, doesn't even fit the rigor mortis on the bodies, the time of death that the state itself came up with. Right? The story does not fit. If the Rolex is at the murder scene, then Amy B. is mistaken when she has some story about having the Rolex in the car and throwing it out the window. 
if Amy's testimony is unreliable, then there really is nothing to convict Ivan Cantor. The fact that Amy is supposed to have a drug problem and of course has given statements to the police that don't match the extrinsic facts, the extrinsic evidence, should trouble observers of this case. Those are my thoughts. Ivan Cantu, as I make this video, remains on death row in Texas. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.